In this week's video looks at capital budgeting. Up to this point in this class, we've been looking primarily at operating budgets. And so now we're going to turn our attention to capital budgeting for some of those expensive, long lifespan types of projects that we typically see in our local budgets. So the purpose of capital budgeting. The purpose of segregating spending out of your operating budget and into a separate capital budget it's done for a variety of reasons. Number one, in capital budgets, we tend to fund these capital programs that are long lifespan, high price tag, non-recurring types of items. So if you think about a city hall or a police department or a senior center or a rec center, those all qualify as capital projects. They have long lifespans. They'll hopefully last for more than one generation with the right types of, of maintenance. They have very high price tags. Uh, they could run anywhere from 50 to $200 million to construct one of those projects. And they're non-recurring in that we are gonna build a city hall that will open maybe next year, and then we probably won't do it for another 100 years. And so it's important that we put those capital projects onto a separate capital budget and segregate them from our normal, normal operating budget where we do most of our day-to-day -day spending for our organization. So we see that done at the state and local levels. State and local governments will maintain separate capital budgets. They maintain separate capital budgets for a variety of reasons. One reason is for increased efficiency, increased efficiency of decision making. Also, by treating capital projects differently than you would treat an operating expenditure, you're able to stabilize your tax rates. So if you think about a structure that's gonna cost $80 million, if you had to raise $80 million all in one year from tax increases, that would end up being cost prohibitive for your residents. And so what we will do with these capital projects is we will typically issue debt to pay for those projects. So the bond proceeds, the $80 million will come in in that year. We will then use the $80 million to construct the project, and then we will repay it over a 20, 30, maybe 40 year uh, maturity repayment schedule. By doing that, you're able to then stabilize your tax rates by having smaller incremental tax rate increases spread out over 20 or 30 years, as opposed to having one cost prohibitive tax increase in year one. Another good reason for having your capital projects financed through long-term debt is something known as intergenerational equity. So if you're gonna construct a city hall, the city hall will be utilized by future generations of residents. So is it really fair to have the residents who live in the city in year one pay the entire $80 million bill for constructing that center, or is it more fair for you to spread that burden of payment out over 20, 30, or 40 years so that those future generations who are also getting a benefit from that building are also paying for the construction of that building as well? From a strategic perspective, having a separate capital budget allows you to plan for permanent results. If you have a building that's gonna be around for 50, 60, 80, 100 years, that's a permanent result. And so you wanna put more thought, you wanna put more um, emphasis on the cost and benefit analysis for that long-term project, as opposed to a project that might you know, be one year in duration. So overall, a separate capital budget for state and local government serves as a really good management tool for those governments in making those very high stakes capital project types of decisions. Now, all that being said, the federal government does not maintain a separate capital budget. The federal government uses what we refer to as a unified budget. A unified budget is where the federal budget will put every federal government put everything together into the same budget, including these high price tag capital projects. There are again several good reasons why the federal government doesn't really have a need to maintain a separate capital budget. When you think about the scope of the federal budget, the scope of the federal budget is so large that one fifty or a hundred million dollar capital project is just going to be a, a ripple in the pond of the federal budget. It's not gonna be something that's gonna bust the budget like it would do if you were in a state or local government level. Now, local government's a $50 million project is gonna make a very big deal 
to that local government operating budget and will probably mean that that local government will not be able to run a surplus and they will then be at risk of operating at a deficit and then be at risk of running afoul of the state constitution. Also, when the federal government funds these types of projects, they don't worry about creating a deficit. Deficits are common at the federal level. Not only are they not prohibited at the federal level, but in many ways, the way in which we write legislation, we encourage the creation of deficits. Remember, a deficit is an imbalance in revenues and expenditures in one given fiscal year. Federal government has run a deficit every single fiscal year from 1969 all the way up to the present point in time with the exception of two years. So the federal government is not adverse to running a deficit. So even if these capital projects will result in a deficit, that's not a big deal for the federal government. Federal government controls its money supply. The federal government has the ability to coin money. The federal government has a lot of strategies through the Federal Reserve to stimulate or slow down the economy. Because of all those economic controls, it's not that big of a deal for the federal government to run a deficit. The federal government also needs to stimulate the economy through spending. That's what's called counter-cyclical spending. And so if you have a fiscal downturn, one way you can stimulate your economy is by funding a lot of new capital projects. It puts a lot of people to work. Uh, you're contracting with a lot of private corporations. It stimulates the economy may create a deficit, but in the long run, hopefully you'll get more tax revenues in the future from that stimulated economy. The federal government is not worried about its credit rating. The federal government always has a very good credit rating, so it's never going to have an issue, issue a problem issuing debt. State and local governments do have to be very concerned about their credit ratings. If a state or local government runs a deficit because they don't have a separate capital budget, they're going to take a hit to their credit rating. The lower their credit rating go, goes, the less likely they are to be able to issue debt. The less likely they are to issue debt, the less likely they are to be able to pursue those capital budgets. It kind of becomes a tautology. It kind of becomes this, this vicious cycle that they find themselves in. The federal government always has a very good credit rating because people will always buy federal government debt. Uh, it's a very attractive debt, and it's very attractive debt because of all the controls the federal government has over the economy. It's highly unlikely that the federal government would ever default on federal government debt. So state and local governments maintain a separate capital budget. Since we are primarily concerned about state and local level budgeting in this class, we are going to focus now on the capital budgeting process the process by which we create these capital budgets. Capital budgets are predicated upon a planning process in what's called a capital improvement plan or a CIP. Every government should have a capital improvement plan and that capital improvement plan is multi-year in nature. Usually it's about five years in duration. And that plan is where you will schedule out all these capital projects from year one through year five. The scheduling of the projects is a difficult process. You would hope that the scheduling of the projects would be primarily based upon economic imperatives, but as we've talked about in previous videos, political imperatives oftentimes come into play. And so sometimes something that makes a great deal of economic sense won't find its way into the capital improvement plan if it doesn't also make political sense. But you schedule your projects in this five-year capital improvement plan, and you also have to remember this capital improvement plan is a living document in that once it's created, it doesn't just sit there static for five years. You need to return to it every year and revisit the capital improvement plan based upon changes in your revenue generation, changes in uh, needs for higher levels of services to be provided to your citizens, changes in your tax base, there are a lot of you know, disasters, challenges from your environment. There are a lot of different factors that will cause you to revisit this capital improvement plan and make changes to this plan throughout its five-year duration. In putting this capital improvement plan together, we will engage in an analysis. We will engage in analysis of the amount of revenue we have available, the other types of expenditures we need to make, 
and then we will engage in a cost-benefit analysis for each potential project to be included in this capital improvement plan. We will do those project by project analysis. The capital improvement plan is probably the result of some facilities master plan that your organization has already developed. That facilities master plan developed by your organization will be based upon a needs analysis where you go and you look at your physical plants and you see, well, what aspects of our physical plant are aging? What aspects of our physical plant need to be, um, uh, need to be reconstructed or need to be modified? and include all that information in your decision making for this capital improvement plan. But the projects that are listed in year one of your capital improvement plan, those are the projects that then make their way into your capital budget. So all the capital projects in year one that are now in your capital budget, those are the projects that you will be funding the construction of for that given fiscal year. As you decide which projects to include in that budget, which projects not to include in that budget, the Urban League provides for us some good factors that we should analyze, some factors we should take into account in determining which projects warrant inclusion in the budget and which do not warrant inclusion. So some of those factors I've listed for you on the screen there, capital and operating costs. So a capital cost is a construction cost, but you also have to take into account the annual operating costs to keep that senior center or that recreation center operating on an annual basis. Health and safety concerns. Effects on the economy. Because you need to remember that if you're constructing a recreation center, that recreation center, city owned and run recreation center could have a major impact upon some of the private gyms that are located in that vicinity. So what type of effect does it have on the economy? Environmental and social effects. When you are building a new capital project here in California, you have CEQA requirements that you are held accountable for. So under CEQA, what you'll need to do is you'll need to conduct an environmental impact analysis for the impact this new project has on the environment. Now, if you are constructing a new capital project that will add new square footage to your city's footprint, you will have to go through this environmental analysis as part of the CEQA requirements. However, if you are reconstructing a building, and so you're not adding to the square footage, but you're just replacing the current footprint of the city in that area, then you may be able to seek out a waiver to the CEQA requirements. CEQA is a very expensive piece of legislation in that local governments, if you need to go out there and do an environmental impact analysis for a project, depending on the size and scope of the project, that environmental impact analysis may cost you upwards of fifty dollars to $100,000 just for that one study. So a lot of local governments try very hard to find a way to get a waiver to those CEQA requirements. Disruption and inconvenience is another factor, because obviously you're going to be disrupting the uh, um, flow of traffic, you're going to be disrupting traffic patterns. There's going to be some disruption and inconvenience to your citizens. You also have taken into account the amount of support that is needed. So infrastructure support. So do you need to run electrical lines? Do you need to run storm sewers? Uh, do you need all these infrastructural supports for this new project that you are planning on constructing? The amount of risk involved. What's the risk that some of these benefits that you think will accrue from the construction of this project, what's the risk that they may not actually happen? What are your consequences of not finishing the project? What if you don't get the project done? What if you don't get the project done on time? Now, a lot of local governments are trying to mitigate that concern by building in penalties into their contracts with these contractors so that if a project comes in several days or a month or whatever behind schedule, then that contractor will be fined daily until that project comes in and gets done. That's a way you can recoup some of the costs for a project not being finished on time, but you also have to remember that contractors can get really creative in terms of finding ways to 
recoup some of those costs themselves by you know having change orders where something actually is more expensive than they originally thought it would be. So maybe the plumbing ends up being more expensive than what was in the original request for proposal. And so there are ways in which cities and contractors kind of go back and forth on trying to recoup charges between each other. Typically a cost benefit analysis is gonna be the primary tool that we use to do this project by project comparison and we've discussed cost benefit analysis in a previous video. But we probably will not be doing the construction ourselves. We probably will not be using our own city employees in order to construct these projects. We will be contracting out. So whenever we contract out, at least here in the state of California, you need to abide by public contract code. And here in California, public contract code, I, I've given the reference for you on the screen, it's BCC 20100 running through 20929. It's a very expansive and very detailed contract code in comparison to a lot of other states. What public contract code will do in California, again, we'll use California as the example, is it will require competitive bidding for most governments up to a certain threshold. So depending upon the type of government, depending upon the type of project, you will need to engage in competitive bidding if the cost of the project is above a certain threshold amount. So typical threshold amounts could be 50,000, 75,000, 100,000, 200,000, depending again on the type of government and the type of project that you are constructing. So if the value of the project, the amount you're gonna be spending goes above that threshold amount, then you have to engage in competitive bidding. Competitive bidding means that you have to put together a request for proposals, an RFP. You then have to publicize that RFP. You have to solicit bids for that IFP, and so con construction companies will then submit sealed bids to the government and you will then establish a date and a time when all those sealed bids will be open. When you open up all those sealed bids, you are supposed to then award the contract to the lowest responsive bid. Now we'll talk about responsive and responsible in a second, but that's the whole idea behind competitive bidding, is that you will save the government money by selecting the lowest responsive bid. That's competitive bidding, and that's done for a lot of projects. Now, not all of your projects will be done through competitive bidding. You can do some negotiated bidding. You can do a process known as piggybacking. The, here in, in California, there's a process, and a lot of states have this called piggybacking, that if another government already has a similar contract on the books, if you will, you can then use their contract, rather than writing your own, use their contract as your request for proposal. So it's very common to see the same contract, the same request for proposal for similar types of projects across similar types of governments in the state. There's also a process here in California under CUPCA called pre-qualification. And in pre-qualification, what you are able to do is you are able to invite contractors to fill out a, um, a survey, basically, a, a, an application form. And on that application form, they will list all the information that you need to make sure that they are a responsible bidder. They will then submit their application form and it'll basically go into a pool, it'll go into a queue, and then when projects come up, you can then go to your pre-qualified bidders and then negotiate directly with your pre-qualified bidders. So instead of doing a competitive bidding process, you can pull out a, a pre-qualified bidder, negotiate with that bidder, and then award that pre-qualified bidder the contract. So there are some ways in which you can negotiate a little bit as opposed to doing all of your public uh, construction projects through competitive bidding. But it is important that whenever you do award a bid to a contractor, that the bid that you are awarding is what's called a responsive bid. So when contractors will submit their bids in response to your request for a proposal, a responsive bid is a bid that addresses all of the aspects of the request for a proposal. So if a bid leaves out part of the project, so maybe a bid comes in 
it's a really cheap bid and it looks really good, but they left out the plumbing work. Well, that's a non-responsive bid as the plumbing work needs to be done for this building to be operational. So to be a responsive bid, it must adhere to all the requirements and address all of the requests within that RFP. So it must be responsive. The bidder, the company that submits that bid, also must be considered to be financially responsible. To be financially responsible means that you need to be bonded and insured, and it also means that you need to be registered with the Department of Industrial Relations, the DIR. Not only does the contractor need to be registered with the DIR, but if the contractor is using any subcontractors, all those subcontractors must be listed in the proposal, in the bid, and they all must have their DIR registration numbers as well. If they don't, then they're not considered to be fiscally responsible. So the bid must be responsive to the RFP, and the bidder, the company, must be deemed fiscally or financially responsible. If you have a responsive bid from a responsible bidder, and it's the lowest bid that comes in, you as the government, you are then legally obligated to accept that lowest bid. Now it's possible that some of the other bidders, some of the other contractors could launch what's called a bid protest. So they can protest that, well, this bid that you accepted was not responsive, or this bidder that you awarded the contract to was not a fiscally responsible bidder. And if so, there's a whole process that they can go through to then appeal to the city council or school board or whomever it may be to try and get that bid overturned. So it's a very long, very protracted process of contracting out to private sector corporations to construct these capital projects for us. Capital budgeting has some problems and there are some things we need to be aware of when we engage in capital budgeting. The one major problem with capital budgeting is the need for continuous reappraisal. We always have to reappraise and revise our capital improvement plan based upon new contingencies and new circumstances that we are facing as a government. Secondly, the decision of what to include and what not to include in the capital budget is sometimes a relatively subjective decision. Politics will play a role, unfortunately, in some of these projects and some of these decisions. So it's not as completely empirical and quantitative as it may look on face value. Third, when we maintain separate capital budgets, we tend to rely on the fact that money is available. So say, for instance, there's a federal matching grant that comes in for this project. So you've got Project A or Project B. Project A is the senior center, Project B is the rec center. Along comes the federal government with a federal matching grant for the recreation center. And they'll say, we will match dollar for dollar, every dollar that you raise at the local level, we will match it with a federal dollar up to $2 million. Well, that substantially reduces the cost of the recreation center. So we are going to be much more likely to support the recreation center because there's more money available for that. So sometimes we select projects not because they are a high priority, but rather we select the projects because they're paid for, because there is money there to pay for them. And then finally, some people who criticize capital budgeting will say, by maintaining a separate capital budget, we are skewing our decisions toward borrowing money. We make it easier to borrow money. That if we have these capital projects housed within our operating budget, those decisions would become very difficult for us. It would be difficult for us to say, yeah, let's go ahead and pull the trigger on a $100 million recreation center because you're going to have to find some other place to cut $100 million to pay for it to avoid running a deficit. But when you take that recreation center and you put it in your capital budget, things become so much easier. As you can say, well, we're going to put it in our capital budget and we'll fund that $100 million by issuing debt. We're going to borrow the money, which you can do in a capital budget. Some folks will say by having that separate capital budget, we have kind of let ourselves down the road to increasing uh, the amount of debt that we are issuing and increasing the size of the debt that we are incurring as a government. But be that as it may, 
state and local governments routinely will operate separate capital budgets, have those the capital budgets separate from their normal daily operating budget, which is a practice that the federal government does not do. But for these capital projects, again, we are going to primarily pay for them with the issuance of debt. We are going to borrow money. So the question then becomes, how do we borrow money? You know, what types of debt do we use? Municipal debt is a lot different than private sector debt. Long-term municipal debt, and by long-term we mean debt that will mature in more than one year. Long-term municipal debt usually gets referred to as being a bond. So bonds are long-term debt. Short-term debt that matures in less than a year, we usually refer to those as being notes. So bonds long-term, a note is short-term. So if we are going to find a, again, a $70, $80 million project, we're probably going to issue a bond for that because we're not going to have that money sitting in government coffers and just go out there and spend it. So we'll issue a bond, we'll borrow the money. Now there are different types of bonds that local governments will use. The first type of bond and the more traditional type of bonds, what's called a general obligation bond, otherwise known as a GO bond. General obligation bonds pledge the full faith and credit of the government to repay the debt. Now, if you look at bonds from the perspective of an investor, so you're a private investor and you're looking to invest your money somewhere. So you think, well, I'm gonna invest my money by purchasing local government debt. I'm, go I'm gonna invest in this bond. As an investor, there is a risk and return decision that you're going to make. How much risk are you willing to incur and how much of a return on your investment do you expect to get? and risk and return are going to be very much linked to each other. The riskier the investment, the more return the investor anticipates to get. The less risky the investment, the less expectation in terms of return. So with a general obligation bond, since it is secured with the full faith and credit of the government, it's a very low risk type of investment for an investor. But what do we mean by full faith and credit? Full faith and credit is a term that means a government will use all of its resources at its disposal to repay the debt. So it will do whatever it needs to do. So if it needs to raise tax rates, it will raise tax rates. If it needs to cut expenditures, it will do that. If it needs to lay off employees or cut programs, it will do that. It will do anything that it needs to do to repay this money back to investors. So it's a very low risk type of investment. As a low risk type of investment, there's very little return for investors. So governments can save a lot of money with general obligation bonds because the interest rate that they'll have to pay on that debt will be relatively small. Now in the world of municipal finance, interest rates are actually referred to as coupon rates. They're called coupon rates because back in the day, when investors used to purchase debt, they would get a coupon book. And then they would literally rip off a coupon, send the coupon into the government, and redeem that coupon for their interest payment. So that's why interest rates are called coupon rates. So in the world of municipal debt, we call them coupon rates. So the coupon or interest rate is very low for this type of general obligation debt. So as a city in deciding whether or not to issue general obligation debt, you know that you are exposing yourself because if you are having trouble repaying the debt, you're gonna to have to come up with some way to repay it because you have secured it with your full faith and credit. You can't default or you really, it's hard to default on this type of debt. But you're also gonna save a lot of money because the coupon rates are very, very low. General obligation bonds are typically used for things like city buildings, road construction, jails and prisons, um, schools. They were a very popular type of debt many years ago. Their popularity has kind of tailed off in recent years as governments have come up with new strategies and new types of bonds that they can use. And we'll talk about some of those in just a second. But whereas general obligation bonds used to be, we used to make up about two thirds of all the debt issued by local governments, now it makes up less than one third 
of all new debt issues. But it is the most traditional and um, most well-known type of municipal debt, what's called a general obligation bond. A second type of bond is what's called a revenue bond. Now, whereas a general obligation bond, the repayment was secured from the full faith and credit of that government, a revenue bond, the repayment is secured from the revenue generated from the operation of the facility. So if you're gonna construct this recreation center, if the recreation center is going to generate enough revenue to pay for its operation as well as repay the debt for construction, you might be able to issue a revenue bond. You capture the debt service from the earnings from running that recreation center. Uh, it, the nice thing about a revenue bond is that you don't expose yourself as much as with a general obligation bond because if this recreation center goes belly up and doesn't generate enough revenue, you default on that debt, the investor loses their money, but you don't have to tap into any of your other resources in order to try and repay the bond. The problem though is because it is a riskier type of bond, there's going to be more return that's going to be expected by the investor. So investors are going to want to see a higher interest, a higher coupon rate. So revenue bonds tend to be a lot more expensive for governments than general obligation bonds. Another nice aspect of a revenue bond is that revenue bonds do not count against state-imposed debt limitations. Let me explain that. Just about every state will limit the amount of debt that a local government can issue. That limitation usually applies to general obligation bonds, but will not apply to revenue bonds. So typically what the state will do is it will say, you can only issue general obligation bonds up to a percentage of your total expenditures, or up to a percentage of your total assessed valuation. So they'll place a hard cap on the amount of general obligation bonds you can issue. If you are bumping up against that cap and you're able to use a revenue bond, a revenue bond will circumvent that cap and you will be able to issue that revenue bond irrespective of being subject to the general obligation debt limitation. There are some questions here and there about the tax exempt nature of a revenue bond. You need to remember that whenever a government is issuing debt, that municipal debt is competing with private sector debt as well. Corporations issue debt. Corporate debt tends to pay a lot better than government debt. So there needs to be some advantage to government debt for investors to purchase it. And the primary advantage of government debt is that for general obligation debt, the interest earned on that debt by the investor is typically exempt from federal income taxation. So they don't have to pay taxes on the interest that they've earned on that general obligation debt. With revenue bonds, sometimes that debt is, that interest is gonna be tax exempt, sometimes it's not. And so it's a little bit more questionable about the tax exempt status of the earned interest with revenue bonds as compared to general obligation bonds. There is a middle ground between the two and they're called double barrel bonds. A double barrel bond will be part general obligation and part revenue. Double barrel bonds provide the security of general obligation bonds, but then they also provide the flexibility of a revenue bond. So it kind of, what you'll do is if you have, say for instance, a $20 million issue, maybe 10 million of that issue will be done with general obligation, 10 million of that issue done with a revenue type of orientation, the entire bond itself is then referred to as a double barrel bond. So it's a combination, hopefully, of the best aspects of GO and revenue bonds. Another specific type of bond is what's called a special tax bond. So if you have a special tax that you are imposing and then you're gonna collect the revenue from that special tax and dedicate it to repaying the debt, that would be a special tax type of bond. I think in a previous video, we talked about creating an assessment district in order to pay for streetlights. Well, if you issued the debt to put those streetlights up, you're gonna repay that debt with the additional tax increment that these residents in this neighborhood will be paying, you might be able to issue a special tax type of bond. 
since special tax bonds have a little bit weaker security, they'll get a lower rating than GO bonds and you'll end up having to pay a higher coupon or interest rate. There are some other variations on bonds as well. Um, here in California, there are things called capital appreciation bonds. Um, there are lease revenue bonds. There are lease rental bonds. There are all kinds of uh, lease leasebacks, all kinds of different variations. And local governments have really gotten very creative at trying to come up with different types of municipal debt to circumvent some of the limitations that the federal government has put on their ability to issue tax-exempt debt. So let's talk about some of those limitations on tax-exempt debt. In 1986, we had a major piece of legislation called the Tax Reform Act. And most people know the Tax Reform Act because it fundamentally changed the graduated marginal tax brackets used for the federal income tax. It reduced the number of income tax brackets, it reduced the marginal tax bracket ranges as well, and the percentages associated to each marginal tax bracket. That's what the Tax Reform Act is most known for, a revolutionary overhaul of the federal income tax structure. Why we are interested in the Tax Reform Act for our discussion is that in this Tax Reform Act, Congress limited the ability of governments to issue tax-exempt bonds. And this is how they did it. And you don't have to really be too worried about a lot of the specifics, but kind of the broad brushstrokes. Congress created two main categories of debt, public purpose debt and private activity debt. Public purpose debt are things like general obligation bonds. So they remain tax exempt. So no real change there. But then they create the second category called private activity debt. Private activity debt was defined as if more than 5% or $5 million of the proceeds are used for loans to non-governmental entities or greater than 10% of the proceeds are used by non-governmental entities in business and greater than 10% of the debt service is secured by and derived from payments, then that's considered to be private activity debt. You don't have to remember all that. All you have to remember is that if there is a private sector role in terms of who receives the proceeds from the debt or who is repaying the debt, then it might place that debt within the private activity category. Well, so what? So what's the big deal about that? The big deal about that is if municipal debt is categorized as private activity, it is not necessarily tax exempt. The bill, the piece of legislation placed limitations on each state in terms of the amount of tax exempt private activity debt that could be issued. So states were faced with a limitation of $50 per person, $50 per capita, or a $150 million overhaul cap, that anything above that, any private activity debt above that, would then end up being taxed. Anything underneath that cap would then be treated like public purpose debt, and the interest would then be exempt from taxation. This is kind of the culmination of Congress trying to limit the tax exempt nature of municipal debt. They limited it somewhat in 1968, they limited it again in 1982, and then in 1986, they kind of dropped the hammer in creating this second category of municipal debt called private activity debt. Well, a lot of local government finance officers said, well, this is the death of reciprocal tax immunity the sky is falling, we are never going to be able to issue tax exempt debt again. So they took the case to the Supreme Court. In 1988, we have the Supreme Court case, South Carolina versus Baker. The Supreme Court in South Carolina versus Baker basically said, it's up to Congress, that interest earned on state and local debt is not necessarily tax exempt. They basically said there is no more reciprocal tax immunity when it comes to municipal debt. Now you thought that local government finance officers thought the sky was falling in 1986. You can imagine what they thought after the South Carolina versus Baker case. Basically what the Supreme Court said is, if Congress wants to tax state and local debt, go for it. That's completely up to Congress. Now Congress did it. 
And so in the intervening years, we haven't seen con Congress take it many more steps toward trying to tax municipal debt, but municipal debt is not as tax exempt as it used to be prior to 1986. But that is one of the big advantages that governments have with their debt is that the interest on that debt tends to be tax exempt as long as it falls within that public purpose type of category. But that alone is not enough to allow governments to compete effectively with the private sector in terms of issuing debt. So they need some more advantages. So another advantage that local governments can use is what's called credit substitution. Credit substitution is when you can replace your credit rating as a government with somebody else's credit rating. The interest rate, the coupon rate that you will have to pay to repay your debt will be directly tied to the credit rating that you receive from one of the major credit rating agencies. And right now there are three that local governments tend to use, Moody's, Standard & Poor's, and Fitch's. Those organizations will then rate the uh, risk, if you will, of the debt and how risky your debt is will then determine your credit rating and your credit rating will then determine the interest rate, the coupon rate that you will have to pay. So if you can get someone else's credit rating and use someone else's credit rating, then obviously you're gonna be in pretty good shape. So there are three different ways in which you can substitute someone else's credit rating. One way is through purchasing what's called a letter of credit, where you purchase the credit rating of a bank. Banks have very good credit ratings. So you purchase the credit rating of a bank, literally substitute the bank's rating for your rating. Problem is that banks tend to be kind of unrealistic in the amount of money they expect to be paid for their credit rating. They also tend to have a relatively short lifespan. So a bank may give you a letter of credit and let you use their credit rating for six months. Then you need to renew that credit letter of credit and when you need to renew it, what does the bank do? The bank raises the fees. So it may not be the most cost effective thing to do. Instead, what some governments do is they purchase bond insurance. And we've seen a lot of governments go together into a pool and they'll use bond insurance pools. A bond insurance approach is very similar to insurance that you use in your everyday life. So you will get a policy, the insurance company will then say, if the government defaults on this debt, we will then repay the debt. You then pay premiums to this insurance company uh, to cover their costs. So you purchase insurance. The best thing you can do if you can is to get what's called a state credit guarantee. Now those are very few and far between these days, but it's where the state will come in and say, if the locality cannot repay the debt, we pledge to step in and repay it for them. California was burned by Orange County many years ago with the state credit guarantee. Ohio was burned by Cleveland. New York was burned by New York City. And so states are really very reluctant to issue these types of state credit guarantees. So the best practice for most local governments is to maintain a good, healthy uh, fiscal solvency, and if you can maintain good, healthy fiscal solvency when you go out for your bond rating, you'll be able to rely upon your own, um, your own financial background rather than having to use someone else's. Another thing that governments have done to try and compete with the private sector is to get creative in some of their financing options. And so in the past, whenever bonds were issued, they were what were referred to as term bonds in that the entire bond came to maturity at the same time. Now what governments will do is they will issue what are called serial bonds. With a serial bond, you'll have multiple maturity dates. And so part of the issue will, come, will mature within a year, another part might mature in five years, another might mature in 10 years, another in 15 years. It just gives them some flexibility in terms of freeing up money. So whenever one issue is paid off, then what you would be using for your debt service can then be reallocated to something else. So the vast majority, if not all, municipal bonds today come in what we call a serial type of design as opposed to a term type of bond. Zero coupon bonds are very similar to those capital appreciation bonds I had mentioned earlier. With a zero coupon bond or a capital appreciation bond, 
the government does not pay any interest payments throughout the life of the bond. Then once the bond comes to maturity, all that interest that's been accumulated over those 20 or 30 years all get paid at once in one big balloon payment. So it saves you some money throughout the life of the bond, but you better make sure that you have enough to cover that big balloon payment then at the end of that 20 or 30 year maturity period. Another creative thing that a lot of governments like to do is they like to place what are called call provisions into their bonds. A call provision allows the government to call the bond in and to refinance it at a lower rate if rates go down. So if interest rates decline like they've been doing for municipal debt, municipal debt rates, interest rates are very, very low today, almost to the point where you can borrow money and almost make money by borrowing money. That's how low the rates are. So it's unlikely they're gonna go down much lower, but if they did and you had a call provision, you could refinance it, refinance at that lower interest rate, save yourself some money. Uh, in the private sector, we call it refinancing. In the public sector, we'd refer to this as a refunding. So whenever you see a government say they are refunding a bond, that means that they're refinancing it at a lower interest rate. A put provision is just the opposite. So a call provision allows the government to call the issue in and refinance at a lower interest rate. A put provision would allow the investor to call the issue in and refinance it if interest rates go up so the investor can get paid a little bit more in terms of interest payments. So those are long-term bonds. As I mentioned at the outset of this discussion, short-term issues, issues that mature in less than one year typically, are referred to as notes. Notes are rated a little bit differently by Moody's and Standard & Poor's, but we don't need to get into the specific ratings. But there are different types of notes that we tend to see local governments use. One type of note is what's called a TAN, which is a tax anticipation note. There are RANs, or RAN, uh, revenue anticipation notes. There are BANs, which are bond anticipation notes. There are GANs, which are grant anticipation notes. What these are are notes that you can issue, money that you can, you can borrow, waiting for other money to come in. And so for a tax anticipation note, if your property taxes are not gonna cycle in until July 15th, you need the money on July 1st to make payroll, you issue a tax anticipation note, you then pay it off two weeks later whenever those property tax revenues come in. That's kind of the idea, a bond anticipation note, as you're shopping your bond around to try and get the best deal on your bond, you want to get going on a capital project, you can issue a bond anticipation note, and then as soon as the bond proceeds come in, you can pay off that note with those bond proceeds. TECP stands for Tax Exempt Commercial Paper. That's a very short duration, uh, short-term issue, 15 to 45 days in, in maturity. And VRDOs are what are called variable rate demand obligations. Uh, those adjust very frequently, oftentimes adjust on a weekly basis. But those are short-term issues, all maturing in less than one year. So how do you go about issuing debt? So you want to issue a bond to pay for a capital project. How do you go about doing it? Well, your first step is you need to decide to issue the debt. So you need to determine what's called your general obligation debt capacity. So you first start by calculating what's called your debt margin. Your general obligation debt margin will be your assessed valuation of property in your jurisdiction multiplied times the percentage of general obligation debt allowed under law. So what the law will say is you may issue up to 3% of your assessed valuation in general obligation debt. That's a very common type of limitation. So that will tell you the total amount of general obligation debt that you can issue. To determine the amount for this given bond, you would then have to take that general obligation debt margin, which is the percentage, uh, that 3% of your assessed valuation, and then subtract from that any outstanding GO principal and any proposed GO principal. Anything that you've already issued in general obligation debt or any other general obligation debt that you are proposing. That will then give you that increment that you're left with, will then give you the amount of debt that you are able to issue with general obligation bonds for this given project. So you need to make sure that you legally have the amount available that you need to construct the building. So that's your first step. 
deciding whether or not you have the margin, you have the capacity to issue this general obligation bond for this project. Once you've determined that you do have that, then your second step is issuance, where you have to obtain legal authority to issue the debt. If it's general obligation debt, you may need to get voter approval. So it depends on how much debt you've already issued. But if you're going above a cap, you have to go out there and you have to get voter approval. In California, you have to get a two thirds approval from your citizens in order to be able to issue additional general obligation debt. If you're a school district, there's something called Proposition 39 where you only have to get 55% voter approval. But either way, you have to get a super majority of your voters to approve of that issuance of that general obligation debt. Once you have that legal authority, then you start hiring your folks like your bond council, and your bond council prepares a clean issue. And, and typically, probably your bond council will be involved earlier on in putting together your ballot language. Because whenever you go out to the voters with your general obligation bond, you have to have ballot language where you say how much the bond will be for, what type of tax liability that will impose upon your citizens, and then what you're gonna spend that money on. So what specific projects will you spend that money on? That ballot language will probably be then vetted by your bond council before the election. Uh, hopefully then once it's approved by the voters, if you need voter approval, then your bond council gets involved again in terms of preparing what's called a clean issue. A clean issue is where the bond council will go through all your previous debt. They'll make sure that all your previous debt and this current debt all the I's are dotted and all the T's are crossed legally to make sure that uh, you're not running afoul of any state law in terms of issuing the debt. A clean issue is a legal issue. So they'll make sure that it is uh, in accordance with all state laws and all local regulations. You'll then hire also a financial advisor. That financial advisor will have the job of putting together the actual structure of the design of the issue. So the repayment period, you know, if it'll be serial versus term, which chances are it'll be serial, uh, how many maturity dates there will be, uh, you know, you know, the, the, the repayment table, all of that will be put together by your financial advisor. Now it sounds a little strange, but when debt is issued, debt tends to be issued in what are called fives. A five is a $5,000 denomination. So when bonds are issued, they are issued in $5,000 amounts. So if someone's going to purchase $20,000 of your debt, they're purchasing four fives. They're purchasing four $5,000 issues for that debt. Why are they issued in fives? It's the way it's always been. So I don't have a really good answer for why it's $5,000, not $10,000. It's just always been $5,000 denominations whenever bonds are being issued. The bond security agreements that are devised by your financial advisor usually apply primarily to revenue bonds. Because revenue bonds are being secured with the revenue being generated by the operation of a facility, the investor needs some more reassurance that they will be getting their money back because there is no full faith and credit provision with a revenue bonds. So what they'll do is they'll put together a bond that has a flow of funds requirement where the government will be required typically to keep all that money that's being used for debt service on that revenue bond separate from everything else. And so you'll create a separate fund just for that and it won't get thrown into your, your sinking fund and your debt service fund. You must be able to demonstrate that you can meet the operating expenditures of this facility so you can keep it open. And typically, you'll have to have a reserve. So you have to set aside one-sixth of your interest payments and one-twelfth of your principal payments to make upcoming payments in future years. Or it may just require you to set aside one full year of payments to cover any possible defaults or deficiencies in your interest payments. So again, all built in there to try and give some reassurance to the investor that because this is a revenue bond, they're still gonna get their money back even though there isn't that full faith and credit protection. Then you oftentimes build in some covenants into your bond issue as well to again protect your investors, 
rate covenants, um, which will you know mandate the the rate of taxation that will be charged that will be sufficient to repay the debt. Operating covenants, where you will have some provisions in terms of how this facility will be operated and by whom. Insurance covenants to uh, show that you have adequate insurance in case of fire or natural disaster. Default covenant what the government will do if it defaults upon this debt to at least get some of the money back to the investors. And then finally, an audit covenant. How are you being audited? How often are you being audited? What types of audits are being used? Legal, financial audits, or performance and management audits. Again, with a revenue bond, your investor is gonna wanna see a lot more information than perhaps in that general obligation bond. One of the major steps in issuing debt, though, is getting that bond rating. Getting that bond rating from Standard & Poor's, Moody's, or Fitch's. So in getting that bond rating, you'll go through a lot of different steps. You'll apply for it. Your application will get assigned to an analyst. You'll then be required to submit your documentation. The analyst will research all the financials for your organization. We'll then conduct an analysis of those financials. We'll then make a recommendation to the rating committee, and the rating committee will then provide your bond rating for that issue. Bond ratings come in a lot of different varieties. Uh, Moody's, they tend to uh, use letters and numbers, so the top rating is the AAA, AA1, AA2, AA3. Standard & Poor's and Fitch's, they, they use more letters than numbers, so AAA, AA+, plus, AA, AA-, minus. Uh, again, if you are in the A range, anything from an AA2 or above for Moody's or an AA or above for Standard & Poor's and, and, and Fitch's, that is a pretty good bond rating. And that's a bond rating that will get you a relatively low interest or coupon rate. But the bond rating really is, um, is the kind of the linchpin that holds the entire process together. If you don't get a bond, good bond rating, then your coupon rate will be so high that it'll be cost prohibitive for you to issue the debt. How they determine the debt, the debt rating, the bond rating, they determine it through how you're using the debt, your plans to retire the debt, your existing debt burden, your history of debt and the trends in acquiring debt, the status of your physical, your capital plant, your process of bill paying, your tax base, assessed value trends, collection rates, which is a measure of your tax effort, the rev diversity of your revenue portfolio, the ratio of your debt service to total expenditures, accuracy of your forecasts and your estimates, the professionalization of your organization, your level of service provision as reflected by citizen satisfaction surveys, Intergovernmental aid, how reliant you are on intergovernmental grants and aid. Your land use, are you completely developed as a city or do you still have room to develop? If you're 99% developed as a city, you're not going to be able to get a lot of additional tax revenue unless you do a lot of redevelopment. If you're 60% developed, you've got a whole lot more room that you can develop and that will be an influx in tax revenue. Uh, your population and wealth trends. And finally, your commercial and industrial tax base. Yeah, a lot of things that they will look at, it usually is typically about a two-week process between when you apply for your rating and when your rating actually gets assigned. Uh, in my district, we just issued another $102.4 million in bonds. It went out for rating two weeks ago, and I just received the letter two weeks later uh, with our bond rating, which is an AA2. So it's a, it's a, despite all these factors and all this work, it still tends to be kind of a, a pretty quick turnaround by Moody's and Standard & Poor's. Um, I found that Moody's tends to turn ratings around quicker than Standard & Poor's. So Standard & Poor's is usually closer to about three weeks as opposed to two weeks for Moody's. Once you have your rating then, you are ready to sell the security. There are two different ways to sell the security. It can be done through a competitive or a negotiated process. In a competitive process, you advertise that you are selling these securities and then underwriters bid to buy those securities. In a negotiated process, you will select an underwriter and negotiate directly with that underwriter. In my experience, it tends to be a negotiated process because a negotiated process will save you a lot of money and save you a lot of time and get you the best deal possible. Uh, if you want to make a whole lot of money in the world of public finance, think about becoming an underwriter. 
because underwriters make a great deal of money. If you are issuing a 10, we'll say about a $10 million bond issue, uh, you can count on about six to $700,000 as your underwriter fee. So uh, it's a very lucrative business to get into. But today, most of the underwriting is done in a negotiated process. Once that was bond proceeds, the, the bond is then sold, then the proceeds will come in usually in about three to four weeks. And then when you have those proceeds, you are then ready to go about executing the construction of your capital projects. So I know there's a lot of information there, but I want to kind of take you through not only what a capital budget is, but the development of a capital improvement plan, the development of a capital budget, and then how we go about paying for these capital projects, because they tend to be very expensive, they're non-recurring, and they tend to have a very long lifespan. So that's our discussion on capital budgeting and debt management, kind of looking at how we fund these capital projects. Uh, in the future video, our next video, we'll then get into the money that we are then generating to pay for everything that we are doing as an organization. We'll get into the discussion of revenue generation.